My guest in conversation today began her theatrical career playing Juliet in a production of Romeo and Juliet at the Connaught Theatre in Worthing. She shot to fame in the 1970s in the intense and powerful TV drama Bouquet of Barbed Wire, which created all kinds of opportunities for her. She's appeared on television loads of times since then, of course, including playing Helen, Judy Dench's sister, in the comedy A Fine Romance, and she even managed a couple of years on Emmerdale. She's appeared in films like No Sex Please Wear British and The Land That Time Forgot. Her West End credits include Three Sisters, Dangerous Corner and Of Mice and Men. She's written a novel. She's toured extensively throughout the UK, recently playing Fraulein Schneider in the musical Cabaret with Will Young. And she was just about to go on stage to play Mrs Boyle in the classic thriller The Mousetrap, playing to packed audiences when lockdown happened. Luckily for others, it's given us some time to talk to her. Susan Penhaligon, hello. No, oh, hello, Mark. <laughs> so there you were, just about to go on as Mrs. Boyle, and I guess somebody just came into the dressing room and said, forget it, go home. Is that what happened? Well, I was actually uh, in my curlers, actually, and uh, <laughs> at curlers and costume, and I heard a sort of, I can't describe it, a kind of ripple going down the corridor outside, kind of whispers. And I stuck my head out and then the theatre manager came along and said, we've got to cancel the show. And I thought something, you know, I thought maybe something had happened with the set or they couldn't get the curtain to open, all those things that actors think of. Um, and then we all went into the green room and waited and waited and waited. And then the theatre manager, who was very upset about it because he had a, a, a packed foyer full, full of audience. I mean, it was a full house that night. Um, came in and said, no, all theatres are being cancelled. Um, and we couldn't really get our heads around. You can't get your head around it because you're no. just about to go on stage and suddenly it stops. It's, yeah. It was a very weird... And, I have to say, I thought, oh, they'll they'll sort it out in a week, you know. And here we are. Here we are. Yeah, mid mid June we're recording this, by the way. So maybe when people see it, things might have changed a little bit, and things have changed actually since then. Where, whereabouts were you? Which theatre were you in that night? Um. Oh gosh, you know what it's like when you tour. You never know where you've been. And you only know the time of the train you're going to get on, <laughs> or if there's a car park where you can park outside. <laughs> the touring life, I know. <laughs> I mean, um, I think it could have been Aylesbury, actually, which is a rather lovely theatre. Yeah, and a big theatre. And that's what's incredible about The Mousetrap. You were yeah. playing, as I said, to packed audience. It, it was... It, I, I couldn't believe it. Um, I I don't know really what I was expecting from it, but I don't think I've ever been in a straight play other than a musical. In a, a musical, you expect, you know, to play to big audiences. I mean, when I did Cabaret with, with Will Young, they were hanging from the rafters. You know, I've never experienced anything like that before. But with a straight play, you you know, I wasn't expecting these this... Um, loyal audience, I suppose. It's loyal to Agatha Christie. She's the star. It doesn't matter who's in it, particularly Mousetrap, which is iconic. I think yeah. it's been on for 68 years, or was. I mean, the pandemic is the first time the Mousetrap has been stopped in the West End. Can you believe that? Amazing. Um, it's something like 60 odd years, is it? 62, 63 years? More, probably. I thought it was 68, but I may be wrong. Um, yeah. So, you know, when I went into it, I could not believe it was a revelation to me. Yeah. I thought, what's the matter with you all out there? I thought, <laughs> what, are you all, what are you all doing sitting there watching the mousetrap? And the other revelation was actually, and this is absolutely truthful, um, what, a, what a good play it is. Yeah. Because I had this idea of it coming from, you know, I started work in the 70s and going into the mousetrap was not considered to be a, um, a sort of career move in the 70s. And I'd never seen it and I was judging it without seeing it, which you should never do. 
And I went to see it because I took over, actually. I was a, a part of a takeover cast. And I saw it in the Theatre Royal Brighton. I couldn't believe it, how clever Agatha Christie is. Mm. Really. Um, yeah. Yeah. Also, I think, it, I think a lot depends on the casting. Get the right cast. Get a cast who really will commit to it. You cannot send something like that up. It would be very tempting with a play that's set in the early 50s to do it terribly, terribly like this and all kind of a pastiche. And it doesn't work. They're great yeah. stories if you set them then and you commit to it. Would you agree with that? I totally agree to that. And um, what she's so clever at, I mean, yes, it, you know, she does the who done it, and I mean, you and I did a play together where every character got slowly bumped off, and then there were, <laughs> and then there were none, didn't we? We did that together. Um, but in the, she, the mouse trap. What's so clever is it's it's almost not a who done it. It's a psychological play. Yeah. It's a it's about what's going on in the characters' lives and how they're thinking. And um, I mean, it is a who done it because you find out in the end. But I I think she's very clever with her understanding of of the human nature. Yeah. The human <laughs> condition. And it shows just how popular the show is. You've got, it, it's running in the West End and doing okay. And it's running on tour and has been for a few years and it's playing to packed out audiences. Absolutely amazing. Let's go back, Susan Penhaligon. Uh, great name, isn't it? Cornish name, Cornish family, but you were born in, <laughs> you were born in Manila. How come? Well, my, my father was in the Navy, like all good Cornish men went into the Navy and then after the war, he got a job with um, Shell as an engineer and was, uh, we were in the Philippines and that's where I was born. But we came back, I think when I was about four, three or four. Anyway, I, eventually we went back to Cornwall and um, that's, that's where my roots are, you know. And I was sent to live with my, my parents actually broke up. And I was sent to live with my very Cornish granny in Falmouth. And um, she's the one that made pasties and saffron cake and gave me an identity. It's, it's a wonderful thing to feel like you belong to an area. You know that because you're from Yorkshire. Yeah. Um, no, it sounds it, such an idyllic childhood growing up in Cornwall because for those of us who have just visited Cornwall on holidays yeah. or when you've been on mm -hmm. tour, there's something magical about it down there. Was it, was it idyllic? Was it a wonderful childhood for you being there? Well, I suppose looking back on it, it's, that's, that's when you realize how idyllic it was. You know, when you're a kid, you just think everybody lives by the sea. You know, everybody comes out of school and, and goes onto the beach to have their tea, which is what we used to do. Everybody jumps off the quay at high tide. This was the kind of excitement of, 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 of the spring tides that, where you could actually jump off the quay, you know, into the sea. I mean, you, you think everybody, everybody's like that. I mean, I used to be aware of the summer influx of, of holiday makers, and I was very aware of the different accents. Yeah. It's extraordinary, and particularly a North Country accent, a Yorkshire accent, you know. Um, I thought, who are these strange people? <laughs> who talk in this strange way and well, I suppose I was sounding in those days I was sounding a bit west country a bit Cornish you know I sounded a bit Cornish in those days did you I had, yes I mean not, not my family never had extreme Cornish accents but I did yes because I had it drummed out of me at um at drum school it was and embarrassed you... out of me I embarrassed I was were yes you? were you yes in those, those days, were the days when, when accents really weren't particularly accepted. You had to try and get rid of that accent. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, now I think they encourage a, a, a regional accent um, in young actors. But in those days, I mean, we had to speak RP, receive pronunciation, and, um, and also a bit posh, I think. Oh, yes. I've heard Maureen Lippman talking about it, actually, and she, had, she comes from Yorkshire, somewhere in Yorkshire, and the same thing happened to her. I think she went to Rada, because now she's gone back to her accent. Um, it's quite nice, that. 
Well, it's good to be able to lose it. And it's very difficult if in your formative years, when you're a young actor, nobody's really sat you down and said, this is, a... I remember I was in a play, actually it was Agatha Christie. And I had to say the word, um, um, oh, uh, concerned. And I was saying, and I was playing a, a, a very posh kid, and I was saying, she's money for jam where I'm concerned. Yes. And the con concern gave it away. And somebody in the show said to me, it's not concerned, it's concerned. And I said, what do you mean? She said, that gives you away. And she went through the whole play with me, almost line by line, just really helping me. But I hadn't been in drama school, so nobody really helped me. So it was probably really good that you could, you could get that training. You went well, to... Well, I sorry, I'll just, just add yeah, to that. Yeah. Um, when I played, my first part was playing Juliet in Romeo and Juliet, as you said. And uh, one day the director said to me, and again, I was so embarrassed by it. He said, do you know what you're saying? And I said, no. He said, you're saying, wilt thou be gone? Tis not yet near day. <laughs> and I kind of, you know, 21, my first, I said, well, what, what should it be? And he said, wilt thou be gone? It is not yet near day. So the same thing. Interesting. Why we're friends, darling. Exactly. <laughs> Long live accents, long live accents, but it's good to be able to lose them. You went to boarding school before drama school, didn't you? And was it, was it boarding school where you found a love for performing, for, for theatre, for acting? Um, yes, I mean, I, I was, I went, you know, like a kid, I was sent to dance classes in the guild hall in St. Ives. And um, I remember being dressed up as a big fluffy duck and, um, <laughs> was my first experience of being in front of an audience and I think I wet myself actually. <laughs> this is when I want a photograph to suddenly come into our interview of you as the fluffy dog. Where is it? Where's that picture? I don't think I could get out of the costume quickly enough. <laughs> oh. um, but yes, the, I was sent away which um, I have very, very um, <sighs> complicated feelings about. Um, I'm not really in favour of boarding schools sending kids away from their home. I was very homesick. I mean, seriously homesick. Um, actually, funny enough, going through, I've just trawled through 40 years of memorabilia, case after case of memorabilia that I've kept. Goodness knows why. But rather <sighs> poignantly, I came across my letters. I'd sent my mother from boarding school and I really don't want to read them again. I mean, if I'd had a, if I'd had a little girl writing those letters, I would have immediately brought her out of boarding school. But I was so homesick for, for, for St. Ives, for the sea, for, for my life down there, you know, my friends. Yeah. Um, but you see, on the other hand, um, there was one teacher, it's always a teacher, isn't it? Um, who, and I did what, something called speech and drama lessons. And she was the one that said, you're good. You, you, you can do this. I think I might've been about 11. And that's when it started. And we did lots of plays at boarding school. That's the other thing. Yeah. So you did actually appear on stage before you played Juliet years later. <laughs> yes. Yes. I'd done all, yes. I'd done all those speech and drama things you can do, you know, you got to sort of gold medal, you know, I did all those. And also it was quite an arty boarding school. We did, we had poetry classes. We had to stand up and speak poetry. I mean, it, it was all a little bit Victorian when you think about it. I'm going back a long way. <laughs> yes. But it's preparation. It's all preparation. Yeah. You don't realise yeah. at the time, but. No. No, and I loved it. I enjoyed it. I excelled at it. And of course, anything you excel at, you you, um, you think you can do it. And also my mother, remember, had been an actress. She was in ENSA and during the war, entertaining the troops. Ah, okay. Um, yeah, so, uh, you know, she, I think she kind of encourages, encouraged me really. Yeah. Um, and I, as far back as I remember, I can, I've always wanted to act. So, so did you do three years at, at drum school? Was it Weber Douglas you went to? Weber Douglas, I think yeah. I did two and a half. It was a termly intake. In those days, we had something called third term chuck out. So that, oh, it was terrifying. 
I mean, if, they, if, if you didn't make the grade, um, you, you, you were thrown out. But it was also the time when everybody got grants, you see. They don't get grants now. No. You've got young drama students having to save money to go to um, art school, drama school. In those days, the local council gave you a grant. So they could chuck us out, you know? Um, and I was very, I was very young when, when the um, principal took me on and I didn't think I was going to make it because every time I went to see him, he'd say, you're too young, I should never have taken you on. I mean, it was incredibly negative looking back on it. You're too young, go away. <laughs> and while trawling through my memorabilia, I came across a report because it was very much like school in those days. We got these reports in these little kind of booklet things, you know, not very good at vocal, you know, voice terrible. No. I had, yes, I had that written down, voice terrible, you know doesn't move very well across the stage, things like that. Well, of course you didn't, because you were dressed as a dog. No, that was much easier. No, 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 that was before. <laughs> um, but and that's the kind of thing that you could read that, and it could really put you off. Your confidence could take a yeah. long time. Oh, I think in those days, what they did was they broke you down to build you up. But I think sometimes they didn't build you up. But I then came across a report that said, I decided to give her a chance. Um, and then the reports got a bit better. And what's funny, if you jump ahead, when I took over from Felicity Kendall in The Real Thing in the West End, it's quite a big deal because Tom Stoppard's play was very successful. Mm. And the principal of the drama school came to see me and he was, he came in very proudly and that was lovely. You know, he was so proud that I was there, but I wanted to say to him, nah, nah. Of course <laughs> nah, you did. Nah, nah, nah. <laughs> because whilst you remember the ones who encouraged you, you also remember the ones who didn't. They stick with you as well. You always remember the bad review. Oh yeah. You know. <laughs> We won't go into that. I've had a few of those. Um, so in the mid seventies, I said, obviously we had to talk a little bit about Bouquet Bob Dwyer. It was so big, but how long was it before that came your way? Did you do a few TV roles, a few, a few things before that so that people knew who you were? I had done quite a few tele television programs before that, you know, something called Seven Faces of Women that London Weekend did. I did about three one-off dramas. Those are the days of the one-off dramas, you know, Play for Today. Yeah. It was out of Seven Faces of Women that I, uh, the casting director noticed me and, um, and basically suggested me for the part in Bouquet Barbe Wire. And I went for an interview, you know. I had to go and read. Um, and uh, that's how I got the part. And what did you know about it before you went along? Had you read Andrew Newman's book or? No, I no? didn't know any, I didn't know anything about it. And I have to say, while we were filming it, I didn't think it was going to be successful at all. I thought they're not going to watch this. <laughs> I thought, oh, it's so slow and ponderous and all these people, you know. Um, of course, it was a little like a soap in a way in, in some areas of it, but what was, I think what it was, it was the relationship between Frank Finlay and myself, because I think a kind of chemistry ha happened between us. Yeah. Um, and I think the director, Tony Warmby, who interestingly enough ended up in Hollywood d directing episodes of CSI, um, he spotted something within the relationship of the father and the daughter, and that's how he shot it, because Andrea Newman says she didn't write that in the book. Oh, she really? didn't, yeah. She says, I did not write that the father um, fancied the daughter. That's fascinating. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's Absolutely, the... that was, there were several themes. I mean, there were sexual dynamics in the show. I was only 15 when I was watching. I think it was on on a Friday evening. Friday Are you night. younger than me? <laughs> yeah. just, just a little. Um, but I remember 
I, I remember the the intense feeling that the that the series gave and the the sexual tension and it was very evident that the father had this unhealthy interest this obsession with his daughter yeah yeah it was very subtly done i mean nothing ever came of it you know um i mean you could interpret it that he started having the affair with his secretary because deborah grant because he really wanted his daughter you know you could interpret it that but nothing was uh, you know explicit it was just the way frank used to look at me um and the way tony warmby shot it and frank finley was superb actor in close-up yeah. yeah um and it's, frank played it like that yeah and because frank and i got on very well we were terrible gigglers both of us we just we couldn't stop giggling. <laughs> we were told, frequently told off, by the way. Um, something happened. Something yeah. happened. And it's, it's actually, it's, it's a very interesting example of the writer writing something and the actors and the directors taking it somewhere else. Yeah. How many episodes was it? Was it, was it one or two series that you were in? I did the first series, which was yeah. only which was only seven episodes and it got 26 million viewers by the end of it. Those were the kind of figures you get in those days. Yeah. You don't get them now. Was it repeated and was it, was it shown globally or in Europe? It was shown in um, Australia because I had to go out there and do a little publicity tour, which was nice. Um, and I can't remember. I don't know where else it was shown. Um, I didn't do the, the second series because my character died in childbirth in the first series. Yeah. Um, so there was also, you know, there was one scene in it, which, I mean, the press and all the Ferrari and the everything really was about the father fancying the daughter. But you know, there was one scene in it where the husband, played by James Aubrey, beats up his wife, me, when she's about seven months pregnant. And I was wearing um, false tummies, you know, getting yeah. bigger and bigger and bigger. I was sort of nine months pregnant by the end of the series. People forget this. And this one scene where he beats me up, I always thought that was more shocking than anything else. You know, that was sort yeah. of I mean, yeah. very, very contemporary now because, you know, domestic abuse is such a big issue. But it went completely in the, in the 70s. It went completely unnoticed. Extraordinary, isn't it? Because of the dynamic between the father and the daughter, they felt that was the most powerful dynamic. Yeah. How interesting. Was it literally overnight fame after the program was shown did the offer start rolling in for you Susie? um yeah i suppose so yeah looking back on it um i'm you know i'm like all, all actors i always think i'm never going to work again um i i don't sort of feel that um how can i put this I never, and this might be to do with me, I never feel very successful. And looking back at it all, and again, going through my trunks of memorabilia, I realized that I had an enormous successful period of doing films and telly and plays. It never stopped, you know. Yeah. Um, well, of course, the camera loved you. It really did. I. I remember that and I remember seeing you and other things and it, no it did and it, and, and it always will because something something comes across but you were it was the 70s you looked fabulous were you ever were you ever told or encouraged by agents or producers or whatever to to really exploit that that sexuality and the way you looked were you ever told go for this job just unbutton the blouse a bit or be sexy did that happen or not never Never, never. The only time I came across that was with photographers. 
and there was there were some publicity publicity shots that I did, which looking back I wish I hadn't done, but it was in your contract to do publicity. You know, you could make a big fuss and say, no, I'm not going to do the Daily Mail, I'm not going to do, you know, the Daily Express, but it was in your contract. Um, and in, I suppose in, the, in those days, or maybe it's still the same, I think it's still the same, you know, they would say, you know, uh, wear a mini dress, you know, or can you undo the button? That was the, with the photographers, never would work. And how were you with that when they when they said that? How were you looking back on those photo calls? I think I was very naive. Um, I think that's the answer. I was very naive. I I I there were times when I should have said um, no. I'm a serious actress. Um, so it was always this dichotomy between this image, which. Uh, the press wanted, particularly out of Bouquet Babois, and what I felt inside, and what I felt inside my head, which was that I wanted to go to the Royal Shakespeare Company, because that was my training. It was a, it was quite a classical training at the Weber Douglas in the late 60s. And we, it was all very, you know, vocal training, and, uh, and we did the classics. I mean, the first term, we were doing Shakespeare. So it was the idea of being, a serious actress that I came out with. I think we all did. Um, and I never lost that and I haven't lost it now. No, but of course the power of television opens those doors. It creates a platform for you. Your profile meant that in, in the yeah. thing at least you could, you could go on and, and do that stuff. And what's, I think what's, what's really fun is that looking through what you've done, um, you were very happy to do Dracula with, with, with Frank Finley, and I'm sure that was powerful as well. And you were really happy to do something like No Sex Please with British and The Lamb That Time Forgot. You were just like, bring it on, it's work. Just keep on working. Yes, I mean, The Lamb That Time Forgot is a very good case, um, uh, actually, because I was offered the Royal Shakespeare Company at the same time. I was offered to play Miranda in The Tempest, and I think I had about four auditions for it, you know? It was pretty heavy weight auditions. And then the land that time for get, got came in because I had been doing films and I wanted to do films. I thought, no, I want to give that a go. I'm doing films. Again, looking back on it, I wonder whether I, it was, it was the moment when I think my career went in two different paths because doing the land that time forgot put me very much into the popular commercial actress um, place. Whereas if you go to the Royal Shakespeare Company, you're serious. What I find fascinating now is that if you do go to the Royal Shakespeare Company, you are likely to end up doing a movie, <laughs> yeah. you know. Yeah, because they want good actors, good yeah. people who can do it. Now, yeah. I haven't seen The Land That Time Forgot. But oh. I presume, is it lots of screaming, lots of running yeah. away from things? Is, is, is it all that? I must see it, actually. I must have a look at it. Well, it's become a bit of a cult movie, actually. You yeah. know, it's um, extraordinary. Um, uh, <laughs> it's, it's to do with the um, dinosaurs, how they were created, you know. And there are a lot of people who love all these films. Um, and... Uh, yeah, I screamed a lot uh, with Doug McClure, um, who really looked after me because he, he was a Hollywood actor and he played Trampus in a big series called The Virginian, yeah. um, which was a huge series in, in America. And um, he knew all about guns and, um, you know, when the volcano exploded, he knew where we should stand to not have the burning bits of cork landing on our heads. He was, he really looked after me. After me. Where yeah. did you shoot it? In a sand pit in Reading. <laughs> I, I thought I was going to go to somewhere exotic, you know, because it was all set on some sort of Pacific island. In a sand pit in Reading. In fact, that is the land that time forgot that sand pit in Reading. <laughs> Yes. Oh, Fast forwarding quite a few years, um, you end up playing Judy Dench's sister in the 
comedy series of fine romance with Michael Williams, of course. And Judy, another giggler, isn't she? Oh, terrible. Terrible, terrible. Oh, Richard Warwick, Michael Williams, myself and Judy Dench. It was a blast. It was, we just laughed on and off the set. Um, we, oh, this is absolutely true. I mean, we took the work seriously because, of course, comedy is a serious business. I don't know. I think that was Groucho Marx's quote. I can't remember. But um, we just laughed all the time. And sometimes our giggles were uncontrollable. <laughs> yes. You know her, too. She is a terrible giggler. And the wonderful thing for me, Judy was a sort of turning point for me because, I mean, it was extraordinary to work with an actress of her ability and doing comedy and doing it on television. It was her first comedy show in, and we did it in front of an audience. Um, and uh, we were all quite nervous to begin with. And um, so to watch her doing comedy was a, a masterclass, you know? Um, but the other thing was, she taught me how to be. She taught me how, as an actor, you can, how, how to be, if that describes it, you know, how to react to other people, you know, when to get cross, when not to get cross, when to let things go, how to be part of a company, mm. how to giggle. Um, yeah. When you yeah, say... She taught me an approach to the work. That's what she taught me. Right. Just by observing her, you mean, really? Watching how she worked? Yes, because it was four years. It wasn't just one series. I, I worked with her for four years, off and on, and kept in touch with her all the time. Um, so I think you assimilate it by osmosis, really. You know, you was, when you're with, around someone for that length of time, you, you assimilate how they are. And of course, our hero worshipped her a bit, no doubt about it. Um, and I learned. I, I really learned. Hopefully, without losing my own identity, because that's the problem when you're working with someone as great as she is. You know, you, you, you just want to copy them. You want to be them, you know. You have to hang on to who you are and why you got yes. there and, and and what the part is. Yeah. It, it's, it's so easy to talk to you about these these projects that that everybody's seen or people of a certain age see. well of course you can see them all the time now because it's all there um but i'm sure there are projects that you've done over the years that maybe weren't as high profile but that personally gave you so much satisfaction so talk about a couple of those yes one of them was um uh, i did a production of misery which is a film and uh, of course a a bestseller, Stephen King. Um, I did this production at the uh, King's Head Theatre in Islington, which is, if anyone knows it, it's a fringe theatre, quite a small space. It's a room, really. Um, and it, it's a two-hander. I did it with Michael Prade. And it, I, I had an enormous sense of satisfaction playing... Um, that part. We didn't, we went back to the book. We didn't go to the film for, uh, to, 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 to in, interpret the play. There is actually a play of misery. We, we went back to the book and put in stuff that Stephen King had written about the character. Um, I mean, it was so <laughs> enormously satisfying to wheel a trolley through the audience with a big ax on it to get onto the stage to chop Michael Prade's foot off. <laughs> because that's, that's what happens in the book. She doesn't hobble him in the book. She cuts his foot off. And we had a false foot. And sometimes it used to bounce across the stage and into the audience. <laughs> if I didn't hit it properly. Would <laughs> somebody hand it back to you? <laughs> yes. Go. Yes. Because, you know, they were, you know what it's like in fringe theatre. They were like, you know, inches away from the stage, landed in someone's lap. But what was so great was because I think people know misery. They know the story. So they were in on it before sitting down, you know, to watch it. It's just when I wheeled that trolley, and I was standing outside the gents' loo, 
um, which it wasn't a pleasant place to stand, I have to say, uh, before my entrance. Um, and it sort of, there was a buzz in that room when I started wheeling the trolley because they knew what was coming. Yeah. You know, it was, it was, and also it was, uh, shall I tell you something? It was great to play someone that mad. Because yeah. of course she's completely balmy, you know. Yeah. I mean, we did work out um, what she was suffering from in the book. Stephen King had done a lot of research. Um, and I'm sorry, I can't remember the syndrome that she was suffering from. But it, 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 it's that syndrome when people s suddenly freeze. They suddenly freeze and go somewhere that's not in the reality. And they will have little ticks and they will start banging their heads or, you know, I mean, it, it's, it's sad. And most of them aren't, most of them are in homes and being looked after. But we put all that into this production. Um, and it was so great to play with a character like that. And I, yeah. You know, the most difficult, I think, the most difficult thing to play on a stage is love. I think love is very difficult to play, and particularly sexual love, you know, when you have two characters who are attracted to it. Very difficult on a stage. Yeah. But give me a mad person every time. <laughs> There's more to come of that, I'm sure. Um, oh, I hope so. I hope I've got that in the future. I know that uh, doing cabaret was a big challenge for you. I don't think you'd oh. sung on stage before. And you managed to do it brilliantly. I saw it. You really were great. And um, you were Fräulein Schneider with Will Young, and you formed a, a terrific friendship with, with Will Young since yeah. then. Yeah, yes. I, I loved Will. He's a lovely person. And I... I thought his interpretation of the MC was brilliant, completely different from Joel Grey in the film. I loved him. I loved listening to him singing every night. It was so exciting for me because I was brought up on musicals, you know, and uh, I wasn't really given the best voice. And also going back to drama school, I was told, because in those days, this is what you did. I was told I couldn't sing, you know, because they don't do that now. They give everybody singing lessons now, and they, you know, they show you how to put over a song. So actually, I was very grateful to um, Bill Kenwright for giving me a chance to have a go. And I knew I had to act my little socks up off to get over the fact that some of the notes were a bit challenging. Yeah, but um, that role, Fraulein Schneider, like, like a lot of those older women uh, in musicals, they are acting roles with some singing. So yes. you really want a good actor. I, you know, I think, you'd, I think the audience would rather see a good actor who maybe hasn't got the best voice, but she mm. can, he or she can really perform it, than getting somebody who's done loads of musicals and has got a great voice, but actually can't feel it. You know, that, the song in, in, in Cabaret, uh, you had to perform, um, uh, is it What Would You Do? What Would You Do? What Would You Do? That was tremendous. Tremendous to see. Oh you well, thank you. Yeah, thank really. you for saying that. I'm being honest. It's, though, it's honest. a very moving song, you know, because the, she's saying, because she she ended her engagement to this man she loves, um, because he's Jewish, and then she turns to the audience, uh, and also because the Hitler Youth is starting up, you know, um, they're dangerous times in Berlin, and. Um, she turns to the audience and says, well, what would you do? You know, what would you do given this situation? Um, I think it was, it's a wonderful song. Yeah. Of course, it's not in the film, sadly. No. Um, I know you had a brief flirtation with soap. You did Emmerdale for a couple of years. Mm. Would you go into a soap again now, long term? If it was offered? Yes, I would now. I mean, I learned about how to, I learned about, I wasn't that happy, but a lot of that was to do because, you, you know, I had to live up in Yorkshire. Um, you'd love that. You should be in the soap. You should be doing the soap. Emmerdale, you should be in it. Um, 
and I was away from home, which is not great. Um, and also, it was, it's a completely different format, you know. I mean, there might be, you might go two weeks and the only line you say is in the, you might, the only line you say in the wool pack is, can I have half a lager and a packet of crisps, please? You know, that might be the only bit of acting you do in two weeks. Um, and I wasn't used to that. But I do admire those actors who are in, in these soaps for a long time. It's, it's, there's a particular, way. you don't have any time. You have to make quick choices, quick acting choices. And I really admire them. Yeah. I'm not sure I was that successful at it. But I would, yes, I would go into EastEnders, you know, because um, I could be at home. <laughs> yeah, you do it for different reasons. And, uh, yeah. you know, it's security, it's profile again. It's nice, to, it's nice to do it. But I think the difference maybe now uh, with soaps is in, in, in the old days you would all rehearse like doing a play or a show you would rehearse together mm -hmm. in a rehearsal room and then you'd go into yeah. the studio and you'd do it there's no time for that anymore because there are just so many episodes so when you say you admire actors who do it mm -hmm. so do I you know I had a little mm -hmm. tiny taste of, a, of uh, I did Doctors and I did Hollyoaks and mm -hmm. watching them just turn it on literally turn it on and one yeah. rehearsal the camera and then do it it's a special skill isn't it it really is absolutely it is um I hopefully I did learn how to do it by the end. Um, so, mm. Susie, there you are on your lovely boat somewhere on the river. You can see the trees behind you, lovely the, through the window behind you. And you said you've been looking through all the memorabilia, looking through all the stuff, um, which is nice to have this time. But are you hoping that Mousetrap starts again? Will you will you go straight into it if it if it happens? Yes, hopefully. Um, it's, it's been a strange time, I think, for our profession. Um, people say theatres are going to be the last, you know, the last things that open up. Um, I think it's, it, 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 it's very difficult. You have to keep hope going that it's going to happen. I think maybe when they have a vaccine or that will help. And also the big thing is when insurance companies will start insuring theatres and companies. That's a big thing. But <coughs> without a doubt, we need government help. The theatres need government help. And there's a lot of actors who've fallen through the cracks of the self-employment scheme. Because actors, what a lot of people don't realise is how actors' incomes fluctuate. You know, one year you'll be doing incredibly well. Next year you might not be employed again. They always say, you know, if, if you win an Oscar, you won't work for a couple of years, you know. Um, and with young people coming into the business, young actors, what, when they're not working, they often go into PAYE jobs. And the way that the government have calculated who gets the money and who doesn't is over three years. So there's, you've got a lot of actors who might have done PAYE jobs and they don't qualify because you have 50% of your earnings has to come from self-employment work. Um, and then you've got other actors who, a lot who are in soaps, you know, who, do, who might not need the money because they've been earning quite a lot doing their soaps and they get it. They get the money. So I'm not quite sure people realize what a flawed system the government brought in. Yeah. And I think sometimes people are not aware just how uncertain it is, but we want to do it. This is what we do. We love doing it. Mm. We love being a part of it. And in, and in many ways, I think this situation has brought, brought us all closer. We really do feel we're a team and we're kind of supporting each other, which is so great. And it's why we've done yeah. this today, seriously, because we're supporting those uh, colleagues of ours, not just performers, but uh, you know, people in our business who are, who are not having a great time financially yes. right now. All, um, the, all the technicians, all the backstage people. I mean, it's, it's, it's a huge business. That, and, and, the, and the other thing is it brings in billions of pounds into the country. Yeah. Yeah. It brings in more money than the fishing industry. Yeah. But it, I mean, you know, but it, it's not being talked about. 
No, I know. Listen, I just want to say congratulations to you for keeping this career going. You're still there. You were there in the <laughs> there now. No, that's what it's about. Longevity. You're still there. Mm -hmm. You're as enthusiastic now about stuff as you were back in the 70s. And that's just great to see. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I'm sure everybody watching just wants to wish you continued success in whatever's next. Mousetrap beyond. I just <laughs> hope the parts are going to be there, you know. Um, uh, and I think actually I do love the theatre. And as long as I can remember the lines um, and stay upright, um, I, sh I shall carry on because, you know, it's, it's my life now. It's my life. I can't do anything else. Great. Thank you. Lovely, lovely to talk to you. Thank you so much for giving up your time, Susan Penhaligan. If you've enjoyed this conversation, uh, please hit the donate button. you just got to get back to the Acting for Others website. Hit donate. Takes you through to the Just Giving page. Give what you can. Uh, thank you for watching. Thank you for supporting us. See you soon, Susie. Thank you so much for watching that conversation. If you've enjoyed it, please go to the Acting for Others website, which is actingforothers.co.uk, and hit the donate button, which will take you immediately to the Just Giving page. And please give as little or as much as you possibly can to help those performers and people in the industry who really need your help financially right now. Thanks a lot.